Welcome to you, Dr. Ismail, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Ismail is the project director of educational technology at Bayou University. He is highly experienced educator and professional with 18 years of experience working in higher education and nonprofit organizations. He has influenced the development of e-learning initiatives at Qatar University and the Air Academy. He has obtained his PhD in educational technology from the University of Science in Malaysia in 2017. And and his MA in Educational Technology from the University of Manchester. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Ismail. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be with you here today. So uh, today we're going to talk about the future of higher ed in post-COVID-19 world. So uh, obviously nobody can read the future and nobody's able to know what's going to happen tomorrow. But at the same time, we can take this opportunity to ask ourselves, what if we knew about COVID-19 five years ago? And how was education going to look like in 2022 in that case? So how do we, uh, how do we educate our future generations and make them ready for other situations like this one? So while COVID has shown how vulnerable both our educational system and teaching standards are, it has also pushed us or post, pushed our teaching standards and uh, made us raise towards an increasingly acceptable of accepting the changes and the potential opportunities and also um, be ready for probably future threats and um, uh, think uh, in a more strategic way about education. So some of the experienced and probably uh, witnessed challenges that we are facing today include, you know, like st stress and emotional anxiety of students, uh, teaching methods and delivery, uh, assessment for sure, accessibility and social justice resources, uh, communication, and, and as you can see, it's a huge list. And probably this is just a few of what other colleagues and participants here are uh, facing and thinking about. So uh, I'm just going to focus on a few of the elements or some of the key elements of uh, higher ed today, including uh, on top of that, of course, students, faculty, teaching itself, uh, curriculum and uh, assessment, research, faculty development, and finally the technology. So starting with, with students, uh, if, we, if we look into uh, how or the long journey they face, uh, or maybe like the life cycle of uh, from the moment they start uh, their academic uh, plans and submit their study applications, you will see how uh, how complicated this could be for many uh, teenagers and youth who are about to start their uh, higher education uh, process. Uh, that includes for sure things like admission, enrollment, uh, course registration, uh, learning about um, the best program or the best courses to uh, to to go for and all these different you know uh, aspects of that process which also entails uh, thinking about uh, forming their own identity as um, as you know future graduates and uh, career uh, ready students but at the same time or in most cases we uh, ignore something quite interesting which is the generation where these students belong. So looking at this uh, chart, you can see how uh, different generations have e e evolved through um, history. And um, each generation has extremely different aspects from the other previous generations. And like the, ne the, the, the nature of their standards or expectations and, you know, even like, um, uh, market demands for each generation is different from the other. So most likely students we, are, we have now uh, in higher education are what we call Generation Z. And these, uh, uh, we, we, like many of us might belong to the millennial or Generation Y, uh, where uh, most, uh, most of these students or most of these uh, youth were uh, raised thinking they were special that they could become anything they dreamed of. And uh, because of that, 
that gen that pre that past generation has uh, slipped out many jobs or many opportunities from their hands because they were overconfident. They were overconfident about many of the aspects of their life and um, their future plans and expectations. On the other hand, thinking about that new generation or Generation Z, as you can see on that chart, uh, they are more t tolerant than others and they are more cautious. They are less risk takers. These are quite important aspects of how uh, these uh, young people think and how they dream about life and the future. Uh, they're more likely to think about them or for themselves and, and not only believe uh, authority figures in terms of like religious or government or formal uh, aspects of life. Uh, they delay having serious rom romantic relationships, for example, or they may have uh, fewer runaways from schools or from uh, colleges. Uh, they delay driving and uh, fewer teen driving accidents happen in that generation. So these are again, very interesting aspects. Another important one is um, how likely they will use social media, you know, platforms, uh, most likely something like Instagram than the previous generation of the Facebook or the, the Facebook generation. So think about this while um, planning for for teaching or course design or or even like what you what you will present to these students. Uh, with COVID impact on these different generations, uh, we we uh, could also reflect on uh, from this chart on how the generation Z, the last one or the first one on the left. Um, are the most affected by this critical time. You can see a huge, you know, impact on that particular generation. And that's like the 18 years to 25 years old uh, youth we have today. Uh, probably one reason for that is that they don't see or feel the comfort zone that they have enjoyed as social media connected individuals and uh, who prefer uh, cautious and safe aspects of life uh, than uh, other things. Now, the second aspect I have here is about the faculty. And um, in that case, we're, we're not definitely talking about uh, um, the, 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 the faculty figure or the professor figure we had in the past. So obviously, we're talking more about an extremely important uh, rule or an extremely important change in the shape of uh, how faculty work now with students. They also, like these faculty need to fill the gaps and, you know, at the same time, uh, find new educational frameworks, teaching theories uh, to equip uh, students and consider new technologies, ideas, approaches, and, and even uh, ways of life and how these uh, are probably new to students. So faculty readiness and, and attitude has to change in many aspects. What, what we're used to do maybe 20 or 30 years from now is different from how this new generation lives, works, or thinks about life. Uh, we also have to consider uh, changes in cultural and academic values um, in terms of like delivery, course delivery, again, in terms of communication, engagement, and uh, and also faculty presence. So what, what used to represent faculty presence, uh, again, and I'm, I'm, I'm citing here Garrison's uh, popular work on different aspects of social presence or, you know, of, uh, community of inquiry where uh, different domains represent what students see as the overall educational experience. So in that case, we have to uh, again carefully think and plan for all different domains, including the cognitive, the social, and the teaching presence itself. So again, these are extremely important, but at the same time might be difficult with new uh, new ways and new domains of uh, thinking, working, dynamics of teaching, the, the, the environment itself, like the teaching environment where it could either be hybrid or online or remote. And again, we have to think holistically about the, all these aspects. 
The third uh, domain we have is about the teaching and the course delivery itself. And as you have all seen or experienced over the, the past few months, we had to rapidly shift from one way of thinking and one way of uh, course delivery into a completely new uh, mode of delivery. So uh, some of the course delivery modes we, are, we, we might know or heard about include the face-to-face -face for sure, uh, we have the synchronous, completely synchronous or completely asynchronous, and also we have the hybrid or what is uh, described as remote synchronous delivery or RSD uh, or the full remote. So these are completely different uh, ways and dynamics, but in any or whichever mode of delivery is used or decided by uh, a faculty or a program director or uh, a college, this has to be carefully planned based on the, the main principles for each of these different modes and, and types. So <clears throat> in, in terms of learning activities, as an example, they should be introduced in a way that is uh, very clear and concise and um, that somehow aligns with what we do for face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. You know, so students, as an example, um, or sorry, uh, like faculty uh, in, in a remote learning, as an example, they strive to recreate the in-person uh, classroom experience in a virtual environment with a mix of synchronous, maybe like real-time real video conferencing, and at the same time thinking about the asynchronous uh, or self-paced learning activities. And how, again, to maintain this, the, 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 the faculty presence and the student engagement and faculty in interaction with uh, everyone. So probably um, if there is a, like a, a key difference between online learning and remote learning, we can see that the online learning comes out of years and years of research, theories, debates, discussions about how this uh, or those types of new learning aspects and environments should look like. Uh, and that debate has has actually been there for almost 25 years, if not more. At the same time, everybody, like on a global scale, has shifted into uh, remote learning, which again is, or, or what we may call emergency remote learning, which is like, in, in other words, based uh, on one of the researchers, is like hosting 50, 100, or 50 hungry people with only a few hours notice. That's something that we don't really expect or hope to see at any time. So it's not a lot of time to prepare many dishes, or but it's not it's enough time to host a party with sufficient food and enjoyable ambience. That's something we have to uh, keep in mind. So uh, that's uh, throwing, and in general, when it comes to remote hybrid classes. Uh, some of the key characteristics, again, could be like the, these types of classes uh, don't meet on campus. They are not like the face-to-face -face ones. Uh, classes continue to have their uh, normally scheduled day and time. Uh, and, but again, with that in mind, uh, we might have huge issues uh, for international students. So in some cases have something between 8 to 12 hours time difference. So the professor might have starting his, uh, his day early in the morning and students are about to sleep because it's mid midnight where they are. Another very important and, and probably stressful aspect in terms of time, if, if we're talking about, again, synchronous uh, delivery and uh, Zoom, like Zoom sessions. Um, in, in some other cases, uh, some class meetings are also conducted uh, in live or synchronously. All students will attend those sessions remotely. Um, partial course materials may be covered asynchronously, as we said, but everything we are uh, talking about in terms of announcements, readings, resources, uh, um, related content or quizzes or assignments uh, has to be hosted within the LMS or the learning management system of the organization. All right, so these are just a few, I, I don't have to read them all, uh, but like in, in terms of like the overall design of these courses, we, we, we're now learning that, you know, there are more than one mode of delivery, 
where uh, we have to think about how each mood is different from the other and what represents a perfect model for students or for a particular group or a population of students. Uh, the fourth key uh, aspect here is the curriculum itself, which remains the core of the whole process. So it has to be fully renovated. It has to be again fully renovated to reflect three main aspects again, which used to be the, the understanding, the knowing, and the applying stage, or like do, know, and understand. But at the same time, we have to keep building on new technology innovations, contemporary topics, and um, uh, like again, other um, uh, new changes and uh, like world changes around us and how, how we can match between the expectations of a course or a curriculum and uh, the expectations of uh, students and also the expectations of the marketplace, including like new discoveries, new uh, facts about life, new sciences. Um, uh, so that might be done uh, through in, uh, like creating flexible and dynamic learning pathways. And by pathways, I mean like uh, new, new programs now are not as strict in design as before. Like some programs may uh, give students pathways, optional pathways, uh, or, or op optional components and um, that could be like on the learning outcomes level or um, skill-based level. There has to be a logical connectivity amongst uh, sequential courses using integrated models. Delivering a wide variety of uh, delivery modes, again, uh, the learning outcomes have to be uh, competency-based. Uh, we need to, again, to maintain and strongly support collaboration, creativity, and communication in, in every single course we're designing. Uh, probably we need to uh, think more about open textbooks and open resources than commercial ones, because of, again, of so many obvious reasons that most of you have or may have uh, experienced already with uh, the current situation. Another thing is, again, uh, how this course is going or how this program is going to be accessible to students and thinking about um, uh, UDL design. Uh, finally, those different um, uh, courses have to be real life fast paced uh, or address the real life uh, fast paced challenges and opportunities we see today. I can skip this one. But like an overall picture of how learning activities um, could be introduced based on the course delivery mode. So as, as you see in the asynchronous mode, uh, there are readings and uh, note taking or annotation tasks that could be offered online. And there are some interesting tools that offer this type of uh, like interactive annotation for students. Um, there is in other cases also what we may call now interactive uh, video based instructions or interactive uh, 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 video activities such as uh, or using tools such as H5P or Articulate for more advanced uh, course delivery. They may use podcasts, they may also use um, uh, some other uh, self-paced uh, quizzing systems or exercises to, to again to enforce the, the learning process. Uh, of course, we, may, we also may have to think more about online discussions and how how, how we may do some sort of a shift from like the static discussions or uh, online discussions into more uh, practical and you know experiential uh, online discussions. So students may read something, watch something, discuss something with other colleagues, but at the same time we may add another element of doing something after. And uh, on the other hand, for synchronous learning activities, um, we really have to be in innovative and think about how we may use uh, like a Zoom session or a Microsoft Teams uh, uh, event to make it as live engaging to students through games, through um, discussions, group work, breakout rooms, and all these uh, other features. Right, assessment remains another important one. And by that, uh, probably this is one of uh, the most complicated elements uh, at this stage, but in a nutshell, it has to uh, be based on uh, 
like reviewing course assessments and um, offering innovative uh, contextual uh, opportunities for students. They have to be course based, uh, sorry, case based or scenario based in, in many ways. We need to shift a little from uh, test like uh, or organized tests into something more uh, personalized through reflections, journals, e-portfolios, uh, projects. Again, these can be extremely helpful uh, alternatives to assessments. But if you have to do assessments, again, we have to think about technology and the requirements of uh, online proctoring and uh, smart AI support in that case. Uh, again, research is again at the front of every aspect of, of our life in terms of medical, engineering, or even military fields. And with the recent uh, issue we had with COVID, uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Uh, Jill Cummings from Yorkville University, and I decided to start a research uh, publication process. And uh, we had a huge, uh, really, uh, response. So almost 76 chapters were included in this handbook which is going to be uh, available very soon uh, in a few weeks from now. So this handbook represents one of many uh, candles that actually uh, have brightened the world or to overcome challenges in teaching and learning. The, the main domains we thought about and considered was uh, teaching in crisis situation, alternative course delivery modes, again, Innovation in teaching and assessment paradigms, again, with uh, examples from uh, many uh, different universities and countries. Uh, the teacher education and leadership in crisis, and finally, supporting mental health in times of anxiety. Uh, in Qatar, as an example, uh, there are also um, like uh, huge, uh, very productive initiatives like the National Priority Research Program, or NPRP, which is one of so many actually programs uh, and funding programs uh, 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 anticipate to support you know national uh, priority research programs and today we really if, if it's if there is one thing we should also learn today is how uh, you know research really could impact and you know change our lives like with the COVID as an example again almost all countries now have been racing to find a vaccine that everybody can use with enough reliability, enough confidence and, and make sure it's safe. So that's an example of how research can shape our lives and, and also future. Uh, when it comes to faculty development, that's another tricky one because we find now that we have to create new ways of thinking and a sense of community, even virtually. We have to invest in infrastructure and, and professionals that uh, we hire and uh, who teach for our institutions. We have to establish mission-driven teams. We have to promote creativity and innovation again. And we have to also consider the changing role of faculty and their needs and maintain uh, all the orga organizational routine. Uh, to conclude, the last one will be technology. So some of, uh, again, the, the most recent trends in, in technology, in teaching, and in education in general, again, is uh, the first one is how, how we think about the devices, what's, which device students bring to campus or use online. Uh, the cloud computing in general is becoming uh, an extremely important one. Uh, the shift from Web 2.2 uh, to 2.0 or 3.0 into social networks and professional networks, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented and uh, augmented and, and virtual reality in general, uh, maybe uh, the evolution of MOOCs into something that may include open sources or VR in the very near future. Digital credential is another key one. And uh, digital security threats and privacy, again, another crucial one. And we hear about all these uh, very complicated issues with uh, ransomware around the world and at hacks and attacks to different institutions and governments. So that's another thing that we most likely need to think about. And finally, um, how to also invest in instructional design and uh, create a, a, a clear, you know, uh, 
framework between what instructional designers do and what subject matter experts do in a course uh, design uh, process. Thank you, everyone. And this is the end of my presentation. It was a pleasure having you on our platform. Thank you for coming and sharing insights. I'm sure everybody is delighted to have you on board and to listen to your session. Thank you so much once again.